I'm, uh, I'm the CEO, co-founder and CEO of Mikey. We're uh, an identity management, uh, monitoring and protection company. We specialize in managed service providers. Uh, so uh, my area of expertise around identity management as well as phishing prevention and the area of phishing, which is relevant uh, for today's uh, presentation. I've, uh, I, I've experienced quite a bit of, I've done quite a bit of phishing research, have had a lot of experience with phishing through our uh, customers and partners who are uh, targets of phishing on a daily basis. So we see a lot of it. And as a result, I have uh, some, hopefully some insights to share uh, with you today. So uh, I'm gonna start. So basically, that's uh, so I've so over the over the last uh, couple of years, I've uh, I've experienced a lot of phishing attacks. Uh, some of them uh, are very advanced; others are very basic. And I realized that phishing kind of works regardless of uh, the complexity of the attack. So sometimes you have very simple things that end up doing a lot of damage. Other things you have, other times you have very complex things that uh, are less um, are less uh, deployed to the public but still are very uh, damaging for the people who experience uh, them so today what I'll cover is basically first of all an overview of phishing how big of a problem it is I'll try to answer these questions how it started and how it evolved over time why it's a difficult problem to go after and uh, what we can do about it and uh, so throughout all of these points, it's kind of ideas around it. And I'll try to, as much as possible, um, like uh, divide, the, divide the different stages of phishing attack to kind of be able to discuss every stage, why it's difficult to, to protect against it, and why it's very effective today uh, from hackers, uh, by hackers. It's a very effective attack. So first of all, why it's, what is phishing? So it's a subset of social engineering. It's basically uh, when someone impersonates a trusted party uh, via electronic communication to try to exfiltrate sensitive information from a user. So the most common uh, way that users experience phishing is over email. So when you receive an email from someone that you believe is trusted, it can be a, a teammate, it can be a coworker, it can be a partner, it can be a vendor uh, or a service provider, uh, it can be a customer. And uh, the goal of this email is to trick you into doing something that you shouldn't do. So like, for example, like um, paying uh, an amount of money to an account that's not the legitimate account, entering your uh, credit card information in a web form that's uh, malicious, entering your credentials, username and password in a form that's malicious. The goal is to exfiltrate uh, sensitive information uh, and also do cause financial damage uh, sometimes. Uh, so that's phishing as a whole. These are examples of uh, phishing pages. So that's the most common way that uh, that phishing uh, today is experienced. So user receives an email, leads them back to a login page, which seems uh, which seems uh, genuine when it's actually uh, a malicious page. Some of them aren't even that good because if you think about it, that's not the way information is presented. Like the bottom two, for example, where a login form is missing uh, a logo, uh, the buttons are kind of all over the place, the layout, the URL is uh, Firebase storage .google APIs com, so probably not relevant to what's, uh, what's happening. The, the one on the right is a Google Docs uh, file, which Leads you to think that it's a download link from Google, but like if you have any experience working with Google uh, with Google Docs in general, you know exactly what's what's going on. And the point here is that regardless of the complexity of the attack and the realism of, of the attack, how realistic it is, people still fall 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 victims to that mainly because it's not a question of what happens on the spot; it's a question of context. So the user comes from a context which can be an email or a social media conversation, social networks, a social media conversation, or a forum conversation uh, into this page, and it's kind of towards the end of the journey of the user with this thinking path. So he just kind of fills the information thinking that it's a normal course of action to take and when it's actually not. So even if you look at the Amazon uh, Japan uh, login page, the URL is actually an IP address. So it can't be uh, more fishy than that, but uh, it's very effective, it works. We've seen it happen on pages like Facebook attacks, for example, with pages that have a blue banner at the top, not even the color of a Facebook, just a solid blue with text written in the middle, Facebook and username, password, and the password has stars instead of the letters of password, so it doesn't cut by phishing filters. And it works, users still click on it. 
So, but how did this start? I mean, uh, we, we've reached that point where uh, today phishing is something a lot of people talk about, and we'll discuss the numbers in a bit to see how much of a problem it is. But how did it start? So, uh, uh, so basically, it started. The first instance of phishing was around 1995. Uh, it started with AOL, basically, which when most users were using uh, AOL, they used to uh, have like brute forcers for credit card uh, information. They used to miss most of the time, obviously, because they're trying to brute force credit card numbers. But when they hit, they used this credit card to actually create an AOL account and spam other users. So that's how kind of the idea started uh, to come about. And remember, at the time, you couldn't buy a million things online. It wasn't that easy. So the, the, the amount of, of things you could do was very restrictive. And like that's the path that it took. And as soon as AOL caught up to it and added like anti-brute forcing uh, mechanisms uh, to, these, uh, to these accounts, they moved, uh, Fishers moved to starting to impersonate AOL employees, uh, which is, if you think about it, very similar to, way, to the way phishing happens today. So they started sending two types of email, emails, basically, either your there's a problem with your billing information, click here to update it. Obviously, you go to a page that's not an AOL page, your credit card information is stolen, or your account needs verification, click here to verify it. It takes you to a page that's not an AOL page where you input your username and password of AOL and it compromises your account. So it's exactly what happens today, but it started like that, it's still do going like that, which means that it's a very difficult problem to go after fundamentally. And, and the response of AOL is basically what most businesses can do today uh, to fight that like service providers. They added um, a warning, on all platforms saying like be careful we'll not we'll never ask you for billing information or uh, passwords via email uh so we're, we still see these types of emails today which uh, which is kind of scary so it so the way that it evolved is that fisher starting uh, registering domains at a certain point in time uh it started uh, registering domains that look like legitimate domains so for example amazon with an additional o in the middle or microloft instead of microsoft the goal of that was to trick users into thinking that the domain was actually uh, legitimate and uh, which would lead uh, to account, account compromise or uh, or sensitive information uh, exfiltration and uh, the way that they the reason they started doing that is because people started noticing that sometimes like the urls are completely off plus having a domain that looks very similar to, to to a real one allows you to post it on public channels which allow users which will drive users to click on it as opposed to having a huge link that kind of alienates the user and doesn't uh, make it as easy for the user to click on the link. So they started doing that. And then this evolved to banking. As people started using more and more online banking, they started phishing online banking pages, started registering domains that of online, uh, online banking uh, logins. They started copying the HTML of the page, redirecting the content of the submitted form to a malicious domain. And uh, and they were very successful at that. And this is something that it's a practice that's still very successful. So if you look at the screenshot on the right, it's actually a banking a Bank of America uh, verify your identity page. But if you look at the URL at the top, it has nothing to do with Bank of America. But it's still convincing. Not a lot of people look at the URL to make sure that they're actually on the right page. So by 2005, over 1 million users in the US alone had already suffered uh, phishing attacks with losses reaching 1 billion. So it ramped up extremely fast and it's been ramping up since then. In 2013, the ransomware CryptoLocker, which kind of everyone spoke about, which infected over 250,000 machines, uh, used phishing emails as uh, the delivery mechanism uh, to the users, uh, which also shows how, how effective uh, phishing is. And this actually either led to a direct download or to a link that that led users to download uh, the file. So users did both. There's not one that was favored over the other. Both were very effective. So most successful attacks, phishing hasn't changed much from, from the early days. So you receive an email, it looks as if it's coming from a legitimate source, in this uh, case, AT&T and Yahoo, asks you to uh, do something like verify your account, uh, link something to something, uh, it tells you that something wrong has happened. You need to click on this to write uh, the wrong. It, uh, so any, any, any sort of request that comes in via uh, an email that, that seems, uh, that seems uh, genuine but is actually malicious. And that leads to a page uh, that is a phishing page. Well, five years ago, uh, files were the, like payloads were files like uh, malware 
uh, that was delivered via emails. Today, over 88%, I think, of the tax favor URLs over files, mainly because, and that's one of the big problems today, why phishing, why phishing is still a big problem, because email-based phishing, uh, phishing uh, systems are more find, have more difficulty spotting malicious URLs than they do uh, malicious files today which are more easily spam, marked as as spam so if you look at this uh, page which the user was directed to i don't know if you recognize it but it's a it's actually a google form so the, the user went uh, created the google form added the IETNT logo at, as the header at the top with the title and email id and a password and uh, notice how i don't know if you see this but password like the o has two dots and on top of it it's not a regular words so that's so that it's not caught by, by, by spam filters. It gives it a bit more time uh, of activeness before it's actually caught by spam filters. So even these very simple like uh, landing pages, uh, that uh, landing forms that lead uh, to the information being stolen, don't need to be, they don't need to be elaborate at all because the user thinks that they're coming from an area of safety, which is their email and an email that looks uh, genuine and they're directed to this page. So double checking and triple checking is not in our nature uh, especially for these types of things where when you think that you're actually safe and not a lot can happen so uh, that's a bit of, on what i touched on on the previous slide over the last five years the landscape has shifted a little bit today 88 percent of uh, phishing attacks lead to malicious uh, have a malicious url as a payload as opposed to 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 a file and if you look at the internet as a whole, one, one in 13 web requests is considered malicious, one in 50 websites is a phishing website. So it's a problem that's becoming more and more uh, prevalent. Uh, so if you look at the cost and the different, uh, the, 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 the different like facts around the market today, so the average cost of a data breach is around $4 million, and at least a third of data breaches involve phishing today. So that's, that's an actually big, big number. Over 60% of businesses have experienced phishing and social engineering attacks. And more than 50% of IT decision makers believe that phishing is one of their top security threats. Yet around 70% don't believe that their existing endpoint protection solutions can block these threats. So they're thinking of phishing as endpoint protection uh, solutions uh, to fight them, to fight the phishing. And they think that these solutions are not, uh, are not effective at blocking these phishing attacks. So th the idea here is that the general sentiment is that phishing is a big problem. And at the same time, uh, we're not equipped to fight phishing the way uh, we should be fighting it. So if you look at um, at a phishing attack, this is how, uh, how this is how it happens. It's, it's divided into four steps. The first step is this attacker who sends the email a victim. Uh, the the victim, sorry, an email. And uh, this email contains, uh, let's say in this case, the malicious uh, payload, which is a URL. The second step is that when the victim clicks on this URL and is re redirected to a phishing page. And the last one is when the user actually fills the information in the phishing page and it's sent to the hacker. And after that, the hacker can just use the credentials that they've har harvested on a legitimate website uh, to gain access uh, to this domain. So it's a very uh, it's it's a very simple process which makes the barriers to entry for 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 wannabe attackers very low. So you just need to be able to craft uh, good emails that sound convincing, and you need to be able to have uh, landing pages. Uh, that look convincing, look convincing to the end user. There's also small things like you need to have a domain that seems, if you can't spoof a domain, uh, you need to be able to have a domain that looks like the legitimate one. The URL of the page that you redirect the user needs to look uh, uh, quite uh, a bit, very similar to the real one if you want it to be very effective. And uh, you need to copy the contents and redirect the form to uh, one of your servers as opposed to the legitimate uh, website uh, servers. So it's very simple. It's actually three steps to get the passwords and then an additional steps step to, to input the credentials in a, in a form. So I will look at every one of these and see why uh, phishing is a diffic difficult problem to eradicate. Because when you look at it like this, it seems like it's so simple that, I mean, there should be ways to kind of mitigate it fully. Uh, well. I mean, there are, but the problem with false positives is that they disrupt business. So it's a balance between false positives and false negatives. And uh, so the accuracy of your system is not always at the level you want it to because of, uh, 
because of the limitations of having very high accuracy today. But let's let's look at, at every step alone. So the first step, which is the attacker sends an email to the vi victim. So blocking malicious emails from reaching um, the, the, the inbox of a user is possible using spam filters, and they work well. But when a legitimate email is compromised, so someone that you know got hacked, Blocking a malicious email from that user is very difficult. So that's extremely difficult uh, to, to detect. Uh, so when you receive an email from someone you've actually received an email from in the past, and you know that this email is legitimate. The second thing is that analyzing phishing URLs in real time to detect a phishing domain is difficult. Uh, like if you give it enough time, the phishing URL will be spotted and it will be added to blacklists. And these blacklists are very effective at blocking attacks that have occurred X amount of time in the past. But if you're looking at a zero day phishing attack, I create a domain now, or I hijack a domain today, and I add a malicious form to it, and I and I start sending emails, it's very difficult for their, these spam filters to analyze the content of the page and be able to render an, an outcome for me so that I know uh, whether this is phishing or not. And then multi-stage attacks are difficult to spot because you don't need to start with a malicious payload. You can start with a conversation and then trick the user into thinking that you're the right person. And then by the time you think that the user is ripe, you just send them the malicious payload. And it's very difficult for the spam filter to kind of detect this because they lack context and, uh, and it's, it's a very difficult problem. But I wouldn't say that the last one is the most popular way uh, users are fished. It's actually just plain stateless emails that that are received to inboxes and that people click on. I'm not saying they're the most damaging attacks necessarily, but in terms of density, this is where most attacks uh, happen. So this is why the first step is difficult, preventing the email from receiving your inbox from being uh, sent to your inbox. The second step is users clicking on the on the link in the email. So training users uh, by doing uh, security awareness and training programs works very well. And uh, but uh, users are forgetful. So if you teach them, uh, if you teach a user something today, in a month uh, or in a week or in a month, it's likely that they'll have forgotten it. Users are sometimes negligent, and by negligent, I mean negligent seems is a negative uh, word, but maybe I would say uh, they're inattentive uh, more. So when you're when you're hired to be part of a company, your job, uh, your 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 agreement, your work agreement doesn't actually mention anything about cybersecurity and safeguarding the organization against uh, different threats. As a result, users don't really think that it's their primary focus to try to prevent this, and they try to. Um, they try to assume, think that it's IT's role or the security stack's role to actually prevent attacks from happening. That's a very common like uh, line of thought from end users, especially within organizations. Uh, so having said that, they would not click on a link if they knew that it's malicious, uh, but very often they don't do the proper analysis to be able to assess whether this is uh, a malicious uh, email or not. So they're, they're, they're negligent. And most importantly, they're very busy. And very busy leads to mistakes. So you're on the phone, you're receiving an email, you're doing this, you're doing that, you receive this, you click on it. And by the time you've clicked on it, you're already on the malicious page. You go to another tab, do other another thing, and then you come back to it later on, completely forgot where you came from and just log in. And it leads, uh, it leads to compromise. So training and awareness programs uh, work. They do work. They're essential. They they need to be enforced. I mean, at least in my opinion, and in the opinion of many across uh, most organiz all organizations. But still, it's not enough. Users will still click on on these links. Now, step number three is the malicious website rendering and the user submitting the form uh, on the. Uh, that, that, that sends the information to the malicious server. And that's also, to a certain extent, uh, possible using firewalls, web filters, uh, data loss prevention systems. Uh, so network level uh, technology and uh, DLP can work, but network layer security doesn't have full visibility to the content of the pages. Has to, uh, it's not always straightforward to be able to block information that's coming in and out of the network. Plus, if you're thinking about a website rendering in a page or a request for a website to load, these network filters, a lot of them use blacklists. So they use also, and most of the time, they use the same blacklist as the email-based phishing prevention systems because it's either the same vendor that's selling or they're all buying from Google or Microsoft. So uh, as a result, 
zero day phishing attacks will go through uh, this layer. In terms of DLP system, they're, they're cumbersome to, to, to implement, uh, to maintain. They break the user experience of end users a lot of the time. Uh, we, uh, we don't see uh, this becoming a trend uh, within at least small and medium and, and enterprises uh, in the short term. So I don't think that this is where the solution uh, will come from. But there's definitely here something that I think can be done at this layer because it's the only layer, and we'll talk about it like on the next slide. It's one of the only layers which is like the, the browser and, and the loading of the page and the, the behavior of the user on the page that, that actually gives a lot of information for security vendors that they can leverage to kind of be able to assess whether the user is in line to, uh, to of, of information compromise or not. Whereas the other ones are kind of discrete events, like you receive an email either in or on, uh, it's either into your inbox or out of your inbox. The user either clicks on the URL or doesn't click on the URL. And uh, whereas this one is page loads, there's a lot of requests, goes to a domain, there's a certificate, there's contents of the page, the user, uh, behaves around the page, so you see what they're doing around the page. You can get an idea of what they're doing, whether they're inputting information, whether there's a request for information, and based on all of that, we believe that you can derive insights that can, in real time, block a lot of the attacks that are going through. At least 88% of the attacks that that have a URL as a payload. So, and step number four is when the attacker already has the password and is using it on the legitimate website. I mean. You could, service providers could implement unauthorized access detection measures, and a lot of them do. So if, for example, it detects a login uh, from the other side of the world, it will kind of block it. Uh, if uh, the service has two-factor authentication and the user has enabled two-factor authentication, that's a solution for that problem. Uh, but, I mean, it's a reactive measure. And uh, it doesn't really scale, so you can't rely on the neb on, on the cloud of or on the nebula of service providers to actually pr uh, come up with a security that prevents the users uh, the information from being used. And if you're thinking about credit card information, passport information, uh, social security numbers, everything that not that's not password related becomes uh, more and more difficult to spot. So this is not, I would say, uh, the area where 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 the most effective protection is going to happen. So can we do anything about phishing? That's kind of the question because it's been there for over, uh, it's been there for a very long time. And the problem with the, and, and the attack hasn't, attacks haven't really evolved a lot. The ones that are successful haven't really evolved a lot. And we've seen a lot of work happening. Email uh, spam filters are much more, uh, are, are much better than they were a long time ago. Like, uh, heaps better than what they were before. Users are becoming more aware of the problem. Network level security uh, solutions are becoming better also at preventing uh, uh, things from loading and uh, browsers and information from flowing when it's, uh, when it's malicious. But the problem is still there. It's still there at a consumer level. It's still there at an enterprise level. Can we do something about it? So obviously, if you look at all of these moving parts, the only thing that's constant is the human element, because there's no phishing attack that's going to succeed, except uh, if uh, the human allows it to succeed, because it requires a phishing attack, requires human interaction uh, for it, uh, for the information actually to be exfiltrated. So we think that uh, this is the best area that you can focus on. This is like the first part of the, 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 the first piece of the puzzle. So taking into consideration humans. The second part is the evidence, which is that malicious URLs are the norm today. So, and everything's kind of happening in the browser. And there's much more mediums that are used uh, to deliver the payload. It used to be email over 95% of the time. Now there's more, there, there's more uh, channels that are used uh, to deliver the payload, which, yeah, which go from chat-based uh, systems for the company to forums to uh, to social uh, to social networks uh, to kind of any resource that you can find online can today deliver a malicious URL. Uh, so we think that the battle has to be fought uh, in browsers. Uh, having said that, we believe that uh, that the, the most popular browsers can do a lot to prevent phishing attacks, but they can't. So they can do up to a certain point, but not more than that. They, I don't think that they can take an aggressive approach against fighting uh, phishing very aggressively. Uh, by doing a lot of analysis in the browser, et cetera. But I think that having like heuristics, these rules that they already have, a lot of them already have. So if you look at at at, uh, at Chrome, it actually detects when 
there's a similar uh, domain name to a popular website. It detects when there's problems with the certificate. It detects when uh, the page is part of. Uh, it detects when a, a page is part of uh, has been part of is part of a blacklist, and they're blocking all of these threats. So I think that more work has to be done here, and this is where like the best results uh, will show up. Because if you look at the four uh, stages, as I mentioned before, uh, browsers is where data related to the suspected website as well as the user action around the website can be analyzed. So if you have a continuous amount of time to kind of do continuous analysis, so gain yourself some time to be able to assess whether something fishy is going on, it's at uh, the website layer because the email needs to be delivered. You can't hold it for an infinite amount of time because before you send it to the user. The user will either click or not, so there's nothing you can do to block it. It's in the page when the loading happens, when the user uh, works uh, across uh, the different elements of the page, like interacts with the different elements of the page. This is where the best analysis can happen. And then the reactive part is essential, I believe. But I mean, if we're talking about blocking phishing before it happens, I think that it's level three. So uh, I believe that there's room for uh, browser hardening platforms, which can be uh, used uh, to add layers of protection to the browser. So what the browsers are doing today. But in addition to that, more things like analyzing the contents of the page in real time, uh, detecting intent in a form to try to understand whether the user is about to submit sensitive information or not, uh, referencing, having like regular expressions that can detect whenever a user is inputting credit card information, when the user is inputting a password. If you already know the password, like if you're a browser, for example, you have the password and the local storage of the browser and you detect that the user is starting to type a password for Outlook, for example, and the page isn't Outlook, then you can try to compare this page to Outlook and try to see similarity. And if you're able to find that, then you can actually uh, block the attack before it happens. So I think that a lot of it is here. So it's First of all, human related. So you, we have to continue training the end users. We have to continue making sure that they're aware of the threat and they they try to take everything, take this into consideration whenever they uh, click, uh, make like make make a decision online. And the second part is, I think we have to harden browsers even more uh, in a way that kind of uh, makes it more difficult for these malicious URLs to load and exfiltrate the informations, uh, information from the user. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions after that, you can reach me at this email. And uh, I guess that's it for me. Thank you, Anton. Um, yeah, a lot of interesting information. Yeah, I have also my personal questions, but ahead I would ask you the question from our audience, Frederick Square. Uh, system administrator, the most proactive uh, participant for today. Thanks a lot for your questions, Frederick. Uh, so the question is, uh, how to, how do we eradicate unauthorized domain names or impersonated domain? Does um, the domain keys identified mail solve the problem of phishing in the mail? It doesn't, but if you uh, use DKIM and SPF, it actually reduces a lot the likelihood of a domain that uh, that uh, that is legitimate from uh, which is used by a malicious party from showing up so it's an essential step it will go to the spam of if it's set up properly it will go to the spam folder of of most users but i wouldn't say it it addresses the problem as a whole it's an important step but it doesn't address it as a whole so if your question is how do you prevent malicious emails completely from being received uh, being received by the users i don't think that this is possible i think that there's always be some leakage like we can rely on these email based phishing protection systems to become better and better at at filtering the emails but there'll always be some leakage the role is to kind of continue filtering this content to a point where it never reaches uh, the stage where the user actually inputs the sensitive information in the form or or downloads the ransomware or etc uh, I have my personal, like, uh, favorite kind of uh, spam emails, I would say. It does not like uh, you just got heritage or something like that from your dead uncle or something like that, but another one, which is uh, you've just got a transfer from a particular financial company, and this event is automatically fixed in my Google Calendar. It is like notification on my screen, like main screen on my iPhone. It's also the tipping point for me. I cannot, I, I can't understand how to manage that. It's impossible. I cannot remove those notifications. I cannot delete it from Google yeah. Calendar. Why Google, for example, doesn't manage it, like anything with that? 
So I think that you can, there's a setting in Google that you can set up. I'm not sure about Google, but I know you can set it in other calendar platforms where you don't allow it. You don't allow the message to show up in your, uh, in your, uh, yeah, in your so calendar. The whole Google altogether, like the whole application not be able to, to be shown in my main screen, for example. But in this case, uh, I will like, uh, yeah, they'll miss some important uh, no. notifications like normal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if uh, no, what I meant is that as, if someone sends you a calendar invite, you can have it not show in your calendar un mm -hmm. unless you actually explicitly approve, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, allow it, like decide that you are, go are going to be part of the meeting. But it's still annoying. I get you 100%. Like, because even even my, um, I get these things on, on my Mac. So you, I actually get calendar invites from people. They look like genuine sometimes. And then I double click. It's more spam trying to spend, send, uh, sell me stuff. But imagine it was actually something that's trying to exfiltrate information from me. I mean, it's difficult. You, you need to stay vigilant. It's very difficult. It's a very big problem and it's a difficult problem to address. I, I don't have the answers to that. I, I don't know, to be honest, how it will work. For example, if I will uh, follow those link uh, to get those funds, uh, I've just uh, just transferred, what will uh, happen further? So they will request um, my uh, personal data or what will happen then? Yeah, I mean, they'll either ask you to authenticate uh, to your banking platform. Mm -hmm. And if you do, you're actually authenticating to a malicious domain, or they'll ask you to for example, lock an amount into escrow to be able to receive the amount, and then you do a transfer to someone, uh, which which leads to the to the to the to the funds being exfiltrated. I mean, uh, the the goal is to take things from you, right? So if you're in this mindset and you're trying to be village vigilant, and whenever you receive any sort of incentive to do something, you think about it once or twice, and whenever it's coming from a user, you know you double check and triple check via other mediums. It reduces a lot the things that can happen to you, but still there's room for attacks to, to, to succeed. You know, I even Googled uh, some figures on um, uh, market size for those phishing attacks and something like that, and just got, um, uh, as a result, a uh, Forbes article uh, on from March uh, this year. And um, the interesting figure is um, um, there has been a 600 Six percent increase. Percent increase in spare phishing email attacks yeah. related to COVID nineteen, and uh, so and even the first thesis on those articles that phishing and the leading cause of all breaches. It's for yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, it's crazy. And now with people working from home, you don't know the people that we work you work with anymore. You don't have face to face interaction as much. You, you can't like spot the traits that make them. Uh, themselves, right? So if you receive a phone call, let's talk about voice phishing, like take it a bit, a step back from someone who claims to be your coworker and you've never heard their, their voice over an actual phone. You've heard it over Zoom, for example. There's, it's 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 not actually the same 100%. So there's room for someone else to be speaking with you and you can't uh, detect that as easily as you did before. Like that's a very simple example of how working from home makes the problem even more difficult. Your, your company is onboarding people that you've never seen face to face. You don't know how they look 100%. You don't know how they sound. You don't know how they type and they speak as much because you don't have this face to face interaction. And we rely on this as humans to kind of uh, create the attribute uh, matrix that makes someone someone, right? So when you start taking layers of this away, you know the person, but not as well as you used to know it before. So the room for actually fishers to try to take advantage of that is, is, is bigger. So there's more room for these types of attacks to happen. But you know, maybe the last question to you. Um, if so, we realize that pandemic will disappear in one day, and so it will continue a particular time, and so it will cause a particular, the same uh, distance uh, distance working and uh, remote remote working, something like that. So what figure we can expect, like in Forbes article next year, <laughs> which percent <laughs> can be, or the whole industry will manage that or not? Yeah, I, I can't even answer. I mean, we have to, if you think about Q4 of this year alone, I mean, 600%, that was back like six months ago. Think about it today. Like if you think about how many attacks have happened in the last six months and the amount of phishing that has happened, I'm really scared to look at the numbers that we'll get at the beginning of next year for 2020, because I mean, it'll show that, that we, we were able to migrate to move from home but the transition hasn't been easy at all. And and we don't know how difficult it will stay as a transition because will we find a way to adapt in the coming like year or so? 
uh, and reduce uh, the number of phishing attacks by training people the right way, by doing the right things or not? Or will we keep experiencing these attacks more and more, which will lead to more disruption across the internet uh, and across the world as a whole? I don't know. These are very difficult questions. What I know for sure is that as a, if you're a, if you're a business owner, you need to think about this and, and, and kind of put yourself in a mindset where you are being attacked. So what can I do to actually prevent these attacks from happening? Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, I, I think that's a very important question that like business owner have to ask themselves for consumers like us, like all of us, I think that staying vigilant, uh, keeping in mind that not things that sound too good to be true are all often false. So when you receive things online that kind of offer you incentives to do stuff, double check and triple check, make, make sure that, that, As that everything kind of public security awareness about phishing and all the possible ways and how to to manage all that yeah thank you anton um very cool presentation and topic so thanks a lot for for this inspirational uh discussion <laughs> with you i wish you a very nice day today